uh, Professor uh, Margaret Stephen Faulkner from, from Sussex, from here. Um, we'll go on to Hakkang, and I'm to pronounce that right, Sesh Ken Algen from the LSE, Mulong Jali Street uh, from the University of Edinburgh, and then we'll finish with Catherine Jones uh, from the Journal for uh, Universities. Okay. Thanks. I'll let you start. Great. <laughs> okay. Do clinical trials create publics? Uh, and if so, how and with what effects? Those are the questions that I want to try and tackle in my 12 minutes. Um, and I'm going to do that by turning to a case study of a vaginal microbicide trial conducted between the UK and Zambia. Now, in order to think about how clinical trials might create and govern publics, I turn to Rose and Miller's work on the problematics of government, in which they locate modern forms of political power not in the nation state, but in technologies of government. These are the mundane mechanisms through which those in authority seek to act upon the conduct of those they wish to govern. And these might include things uh, like inscription devices, uh, measurement and display techniques, forms of standardization, uh, assessments, and, and that kind of thing. You're probably familiar with this work. Um, so it's through such technologies that, um, that power accrues to those who deploy them because these strategies enable both the production of particular kinds of subjects, but also render them knowable. So I want to suggest in this talk that uh, clinical trials can be seen as technologies of government, which institutionalize the surveillance and the objectification of the body and the creation of particular kinds of subjects in those whom they recruit. So regular techniques involved in the management of trial subjects include uh, observation, measurement, uh, notation, and comparing individuals to uh, population norms. So I want to suggest that the randomized control trial constitutes particular problematics of government which frame and create participants and publics. Now, I'm using the term publics here rather than public because I want to suggest that these kinds of, um, that these trials create a transient form of public, if you like. Um, so the technologies are instituted for a very intense but finite period of time covering the, the trial's duration. Uh, and what happens when the trial ends is something that I'll return to later on. So, not only are these trials transient, but they're also exclusive. Uh, trial protocols stipulate a series of inclusion criteria, the aim of which is to exclude certain kinds of people who are not suitable to take part, uh, to participate. Now, over the past two decades, there's been a transition to what Epstein has characterized as the inclusion and difference paradigm in biomedical research. He argues um, that there's been a move to include what are perceived to be underrepresented groups in clinical research um, based on categorical identities such as sex, race, and sexual orientation. And he traces the categorical alignment work that advocates have had to do to superimpose categories of political mobilization and administration onto biomedicine. And this kind of uncritical transposition, he argues, has had a profound impact on the policies and surveillance systems that prescribe biomedical work practices. So, brought into conversation with each other, Rosen Miller's Problematics of Government and Epstein's Inclusion and Difference Paradigm provide some kind of, um, sort of conceptual apparatus, if you like, to think about um, the framing, the formation, and the regulation of biomedical publics. Uh, and so here I'm going to use these ideas to look at uh, a transient trial public in Zambia, uh, and, and certain problems that, uh, that the trialists encountered in relation to their public's other. Uh, and this was a trial that recruited only women, and so here I'm really talking about the men. So the trial in question was designed to test the vaginal microbicide. Um, these are experimental products that are designed to prevent HIV infection in women. Uh, as a result of strong international advocacy that came predominantly from the women's health movement, these came to prominence in the 90s as a form of HIV prevention that it was said would empower women to protect themselves from uh, HIV infection by their male partners. Uh, now, the research agenda for microbicides focused very much on recruiting women to test candidate products in clinical trials. Um, men have often been represented through what I would call a deficit model of masculinity that has really posited them as uh, a cause of women's oppression and poor health outcomes. 
So here I'm drawing on one particular trial called MDP301. This was conducted between 2005 and 2009 by the Microbicides Development Programme, which was funded by the UK government through DFID and also the MRC. Now there were various sites, and I'm just talking about the Zambian site here, which uh, was located on a large sugar estate in Mazabuka, uh, which currently is home to Africa's largest sugar mill. I should say that participation and community involvement were very keenly emphasised aspects of this trial, and indeed uh, others and third parties have reported that the trial um, was exemplary in this respect. As you might expect in, uh, in a trial of HIV prevention, women's sexual behaviour was actively monitored and regulated. So women were counselled, for example, to be on a regular form of contraception, a reliable form of contraception, sorry. They were required to have a pregnancy test every four weeks. Um, they were asked not to have more than 14 sex acts in a week, advised not to insert things into their vagina, not to wash within an hour of sex, and not to have anal sex. Now there were also self-regulatory techniques, such as uh, women being asked to complete coital diaries and to return used and unused gel applicators to the clinic for accounting purposes. And these really aligned women's sort of apparently autonomous choices with the ends of public health and government. Our mm. men were not included in this form of participation, perhaps for obvious reasons, but then they very much reported feeling excluded from this particular uh, sort of biopublic sphere. Now, in spite of this strong community involvement program that I've talked about, the trial ran into several difficulties, these primarily being um, rumours that the research was satanic uh, and opposition by men in the community to their partners' participation. Rumors, these kind of rumours around blood stealing are quite common in relation to medical research in Africa. Um, they have variously been interpreted as a, a popular form of resistance, uh, ignorance of medical research, or as local responses to research ethics in the context of globalisation um, and unequal access to resources. Now, the most prevalent rumour circulating at the time of the trial was that MDP took women's blood and either used it for satanic rituals or sold it in the UK or South Africa. Now, whilst the trial staff linked these rumours of Satanism to men's opposition to the programme, some also suggested that women were also perpetuating these rumours, but only those women who had been found ineligible to join the study. And common to these rumours was a link between um, blood, wealth accumulation and foreign infiltration. Several issues combined at this time um, to produce anxiety amongst men uh, and hostility towards the trial. There was a recent takeover of Zambia Sugar by South African investors and reform of the pension scheme. And this coincided with the arrival of the UK-funded trial on the sugar estate, which was re recruiting people for voluntary counselling and testing. According to staff members, not only uh, was were clinical trials uh, something that was quite alien to the community, but HIV was highly stigmatised. It was very much bound up um, with, with fear of death, uh, loss of income, desertion by one's spouse, um, and, and so knowing one's HIV status was, was seen to be very problematic indeed. At the same time, MDP was drawing what were perceived to be large amounts of blood and was giving women um, money in, in return uh, and of course, this was a form of reimbursement for their participation in the research. <clears throat> so the extraction of precious resources, whether that's blood from female trial participants or sugar from the labour of their male partners, was very much linked in, the, in people's imagination to the UK. Um, as was well known in the community, the trial was funded by the UK Department for International Development. Uh, at the same time, however, Zambia Sugar had recently been acquired by Associated British Foods, subsequently uh, accused of corporate tax avoidance and of not having paid any corporate tax in Zambia at all between 2008 and 2010. <coughs> White suggests that we interpret rumours as a way of talking that encourages a reassessment of everyday experience to address the workings of power and knowledge and how regimes use them. Focus groups that I conducted with men were very much permeated by um, a discourse of exclusion regarding the trial um, and a sense of injustice that they had been sidelined by the researchers. The fact that MDP was only recruiting women uh, without actively seeking to involve men in the trial 
sort of in some way threatened the governing relationships that existed before the trial came along. So whereas the research framed women as newly empowered scientific citizens through their active participation, men found themselves represented, as it were, through a, this deficit model of masculinity, and they very much lacked a sanctioned voice within the trial structures. So by excluding men from this process, the trial threatened established power relations between men and women, um, whereby decision-making is generally a male prerogative and, and women often seek permission for their actions. By recruiting only women to the research and only gaining the women's consent to take part, men, the men who I spoke to saw the trial as disregarding this very well-established norm um, and directly challenging control over their wives and partners. And I think it's in this context that we should consider the rumours about Satanism, um, perhaps as an expression of mistrust towards forms of power and knowledge um, that were encroaching on men's everyday lives and which were located in a kind of a world order, if you like, that, about which they had deep <coughs> doubts. And I think those doubts related to the fact not only that women could control um, their use of the microbicide gel and enrol in the trial without their partner's consent, um, but more fundamentally, there were issues around control of women moving from themselves as the male partner to the trialists. In 2009, um, the trial announced its results. The microbicide gel was safe but not effective in preventing HIV transmission. Now, the reception of this result in Zambia was incendiary. Uh, a blogger from, uh, writing from Lusaka presented the trial as a botched and criminal scandal that had uh, infected large numbers of poor and illiterate Zambian women. Uh, the story was taken up by the national press and a furore erupted, which led to the temporary suspension of microbicide trials in the country. Um, the entries in the blog implied that uh, the knowledge that the trial was generating was being withheld from Zambians locally and was being sent out of the country to the UK. It also called for the arrest and the punishment of the researchers, uh, suggesting that they posed a threat both to the nation and to the sovereignty of local leaders. Now the closing of the trial and the ceasing of its practices, which I'm characterising as technologies of government, I think allowed these, um, allowed the articulation, if you like, of these counter-narratives in relation to medical research. During, the, during its lifetime, the trial did create a public of female biocitizens uh, who were framed as informed, agential, uh, and represented through procedures such as blood testing, uh, genital examinations, the collection of demographic and sexual behaviour data, they became governable subjects. But I think when we look at what happens when the trial ceased, I mean, although we, we haven't got any data on what happened to these, to these women, in a way, the, the response um, from those who weren't included in the, in the trial suggests that this public was a temporary one. So a couple of conclusions. Um, firstly, I think we need to understand how the biomedical difference and inclusion paradigm has effects beyond endpoint analyses. So that is, the recruitment of particular groups to clinical trials isn't simply a scientific question, but has deep social implications relating to representation and even citizenship. Narratives of inclusion and exclusion perform a very powerful role in enabling and foreclosing uh, the, the participation of particular social groups and thereby does shape pathways of epidemic response. I think instrumentalist models of community consultation and public participation can therefore be seen as perhaps not being adequate. Secondly, the case that I've presented demonstrates the transience of techniques of government within global health research and also the forms of resistance that it can engender. Publics aren't created just once and for all times and, and nor is their governance monolithic. Uh, rather than focusing, therefore, only on the particular subjects that um, biomedical research impels, we should also be looking um, at, the, at the outsides of these publics, so the constitutive outsides of biomedical publics. Um, these subjects are located not in the kind of social vacuum that the RCT idealises, but they're situated very much at the intersection of multiple um, pathways of inclusion and exclusion, both locally and globally. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take questions. I should have uh, said that before, but we'll take questions at the end. And Peter Agerton uh, from.